Hi, my name is Molly Devine, and I'm the Individual Giving Manager with Women Who Code. I'm excited to welcome Irina Markopol and Patricia Egger to the Women Who Code podcast. Irina is the Brand and Community Lead at Proton. As the Brand and Community Lead at Proton, Irina has been instrumental in shaping the company's image since joining as the first marketing hire in 2017. With 12 years of marketing experience covering brand, research, design, and content, Irina brings a diverse skill set to her role at Proton. Most recently, she has successfully led and contributed to high impact projects such as Proton's rebranding and their yearly charity fundraiser. And Patricia is the security co lead at Proton. Patricia is a mathematician who's passionate about people. She's currently Proton's security officer. She previously held a similar role at Kodolsky Security and before that at Deloitte, where she advised financial services and pharmaceutical companies on improving their cybersecurity posture. In addition, Patricia is a co-founder of the Women in Cyber Association in Switzerland and will be the vice president starting in a few weeks. She's also participated in many different initiatives related to tech, security, and innovation, mostly in Switzerland and often, but not always, with the goal of promoting gender diversity. I was lucky enough to connect with Irina and her team at Proton last December when they contacted Women Who Code to be potential recipients of donation funds acquired through their annual ProTime Lifetime Account Charity Raffle. Out of 600 potential charities, Women Who Code was chosen as one of 10 to receive a donation. The 2022 raffle raised a record-breaking $784,670, of which Proton donated $71,800 to Women Who Code. Before we dive more into your backgrounds, for members who may be unfamiliar with Proton, Irina, can you share a little bit about Proton, how it got started, and the company's mission and goals? Yes, uh, thank you, Molly. Thank you for having us on the Women Who Code podcast. We're very excited to be here. At least I am. I hope Patricia is too. <laughs> um, Proton is a software company um, on a mission to build a better internet, um, a better internet by making it more private. So the way we do this is by building privacy first alternatives to services like uh, Dropbox, Gmail, um, that basically empower people, millions of people actually, to protect their online privacy and retain control over their data. Um, our current ecosystem includes encrypted email, uh, file storage solution, calendar, and VPN, all built on this principle of your data, your rules. So you decide what happens to your data and not advertisers or big tech. Our story actually began uh, over nine years ago in Switzerland, uh, where a team of former CERN scientists uh, from the European Organization of Nuclear Research have envisioned a more private and secure way of communicating via email. And this is how our first service, ProtonMail, was born. But since then, many things have changed. So today, Proton is actually a global company with a team of over 450 people that work across different offices, across six offices around the world from our Geneva headquarters and uh, remote. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, can you both share about your role at Proton and, you know, any big wins you may have had or big projects you've worked on? I've joined the company early on, as you've mentioned, Molly, I joined as the first marketing hire. So in the past six years, I have been quite fortunate to be part of many projects that I'm very proud of. Um, but it has changed quite a lot from the beginning where I've joined as a jack of all trades, really, which gave me a unique opportunity to get to know our community really well and to see it grow and to contribute to its growth, to learn about our users and understand their needs to learn about our products and see them, how they were built from the ground up. Um, and also to work very closely with our founders since the very beginning to understand his vision for the company and what we are going to succeed in doing or what we want to succeed in doing. Um, one of the projects that I'm most proud of is definitely the project that where we got to know each other in the um, Proton fundraiser. This is this has become a tradition at Proton. Um, it started as an idea simply because Proton as an organization has started with a um, crowdfund campaign. So our first funding or our only an initial funding came from a crowdfunding campaign in 2014, um, where the community came together and allowed us to actually build our first product, Proton Mail. And in the spirit of this crowdfund, um, 
we thought now since 2018, since the company became more stable and we've built, um, a, we reached a critical mass in our community of enough people who believe in privacy and want to fight for it. Um, we, we thought it would be great to start giving back to the community as well. So we built this new project. We launched this new project called the Proton Lifetime Account Fundraiser, which happens every year. Um, and we use our community's support to raise money for various organizations that do good in the world, uh, meaning organizations that support either activist organizations, organizations that uh, protect people's civil rights, that develop work in privacy or security, and this year, uh, we chose Women Who Code as one of the, uh, the recipients as well. Um, but in the past, we've supported other organizations such as uh, Reporters Without Borders, None of Your Business. It's, um, it's uh, Mark Schrem's organization um, that fights for privacy online, uh, The Markup, Epic, um, and many others. I, I love that. Actually, I, I saved a quote from your CEO, uh, Andy Yen, uh, that he shared with us recently regarding the fundraiser. Uh, if I can read it quickly, it's he mentioned, you know, we believe uh, empowering women to enter STEM and becoming more active in cybersecurity ultimately leads to a better Internet. We saw an example of this in Iran where tech savvy young women uh, led a, a protest movement by widely leveraging privacy tools like Proton's VPN, which was ultimately downloaded by millions of Iranians. And I think, you know, what you spoke to um, just, just really exemplifies that, you know, not only supporting um, people in terms of, of what they're doing and utilizing the, the product of Proton to, to do these really amazing things in tech, but also then supporting these industries that are also moving that forward. So empowering women like Women Who Code does um, or, or some of your other nonprofits, but also empowering security and safety and privacy. And I think that's that's really honorable to take that company, not just um, to do something amazing, but to to really put, um, you know, your money where your mouth is right and then support from a, a donor standpoint as well. We, we so appreciate it. What about you, Patricia? Yeah, so as, as you mentioned in the, the intro, I'm a security officer, which means a, a lot of different things to in different companies. But um, basically, the way I uh, the way I summarize my role, I guess, is to to try to understand what our security risks are. So, as a company, um, in figure out how we can measure them, how we can quantify that, um, and then just try to help figure out what we can do about it. Um, so, it's basically, you know, in a nutshell, trying to make sure that we're investing the right resources for the right problems. Um, and so, this is in order to find what those the security risks are. Um, I work a lot with basically all of the other teams, all of the other people in the company. So um, a lot of that is so the engineering team, since they they build uh, the things that we use, especially at Proton, because we use a lot of our own stuff. Um, but also, you know, legal and finance and all of these people who who would have, uh, you know, let's say data protect, uh, data to protect or, or things like that. And so I um, I feel like I'm kind of sitting between all of these teams and. Uh, management teams or leadership, as we call it at Proton, um, as they, you know, they know what their priorities for the company are. They also know what resources are available and, you know, what they want to do first or things like that. And so I try to kind of translate amongst different teams and and, and make sure we're kind of moving in the, in the right direction. Um, so, yeah, I don't do coding as such, but um, I think it's really helpful for me to understand um, a lot of what the engineers are doing on a daily basis. As well as the other teams, um, but since they really are, you know, have their hands in in in, uh, in a lot of what we do and what we put out, uh, it's really it's really helpful to understand what they're what they're going through or you know, what struggles they may be having, what priorities or how they see things. Um, so yeah, that's um, I think that's basically what I do. Perfect. Um, you know, both of you obviously working for Proton, being a, a tech uh, company, um, are now in that tech field. Uh, what drew you to, to working in tech um, and what's the experience been like? Thank you for the question, Molly. So for me, it's been always really kind of, um, I was trying to find an industry where since we work five days a week and probably more than half of our lives, I wanted to find an industry where I can find purpose like every other millennial out there, I guess. And tech was the easiest, um, the easiest answer to my question. 
I was wondering where can I find a company or companies where I can find people who are kind, people who are smart, people who I would feel that I can learn from. And I'm sure there are other industries, but for me, tech was that industry. And because I grew up next to my, um, very closely with my cousin who has, who is a software developer and who is, who is really good at math and physics. And I've always been extremely, um, intimidated by these um these sciences i thought okay i am not that great at math but i'm an extrovert and i am creative so i can find my way into tech in a different way and this is kind of what i did i i think i think about myself as a creative problem solver and in tech this is something that many companies appreciate especially at the beginning of a company as i was mentioning my jack of all trades role at proton this is something that many startups need at the beginning and this is how i found my way into tech um but it was not through proton it was actually a different company that i joined um in austria and vienna um we were organizing tech conferences so i went into tech full on i met so many startups doing so many amazing things all saving the world in their own little way. And this is what really started my passion for, for tech. And I wanted to learn more. And that's how I learned about Proton. Awesome. Tech by proxy in some way. <laughs> exactly. What about you, Patricia? Yeah, I think it's actually quite similar to what Irina was saying. I think also it was really important for me to, to work for a company that I believed in. Um, and also... I really like uh, my field. I, I really like what I what I do for work, and so I wanted to to do it in a company where it would be important. Um, and so, in cybersecurity, you can do that in, in basically any company. Um, but I wanted to do it in one where it would be kind of front and center. Um, and so that's why I was at Kudelski Security uh, at first, which, as its name indicates, was a security company. Um, and then, and then Proton, because it's also, you know, privacy, but security, they, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so I wanted, yeah, I wanted to go into, uh, into an industry where it was really important. Uh, but not, ne- not only because of like regulations and compliance, which, you know, banking, you know, being from Switzerland and Geneva, there's a lot of banking, uh, jobs around, but I didn't really feel like putting on a suit every day and, um, and just focusing on, you know, regulations and compliance and audits and that kind of stuff. I wanted, you know, maybe a little bit more creativity and a little bit more, you know, left and right and things like that. So um, that's what I was looking for. And I kind of progressively went from, you know, a pretty big company being Deloitte to like a medium sized company at Kodelsky Security and then a smaller one uh, being Proton. It's not so small anymore, but even when I joined about a year and a half ago, it was already significantly smaller than it is now. So that was kind of my, um, yeah, my journey into into tech, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And I think um, you both touched on on something that I think is unique about tech. And it's that it's this field where there are these people that bring this specific skill set, but they apply it in such a way that can change the world and make the world a better place and do things that, you know, support their community and in things you wouldn't expect. And And I think that makes the field a really unique field to get into because, yeah, like, you know, you can go be, you know, a financial analyst, right, and just deal with with money and 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 things like that all the time. Or you can go, you know, um, you know, work in different fields or different different arenas. But tech really gives you that unique ability to to find something that is in a, a kind of a unique and creative field and a growing field, but that also makes an impact on your community. And I think that's what you've found where you are at Proton. Um, you know, knowing that you're in this this tech field, and and we know that. Um, women are often minorities in the tech workplace. Um, as women working for a tech company, um, what are your thoughts on on gender diversity in the tech industry, and what has been your personal experience? I think I have a bit of a biased view because I've, since my studies, I've always been surrounded by more men than women. Um, in in math, I think there were thirty percent women, which is not horrendous, but it's also you know far from fifty. Um, and then. I was in uh, the like cyber um, team at Deloitte, which was also mostly men. Um, Kudelski Security, I was the only woman. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm used to it. Um, I don't mind it that much. Uh, it, it's really nice when there are other women around. Just, I don't know, there's something about the, the, um, the ambiance that is 
just nice when there's a when there's another woman there, but it is very rare. Um, and I have been in some like conference calls every once in a while where there were only women, and it's just the weirdest thing for me, and I kind of love it. But um, yeah, I think in general, I've I've had a good time with it. Otherwise, I would you know would have left and would have started to do something else. So I've had a generally uh, good experience. Um, there there have been instances where things didn't go necessarily what I wanted or there, you know, there have been comments or things like that. And it's, I think it's really tough because you don't know whether it's just a comment for a comment or if it's because you're the only woman or it's because maybe I look significantly younger than a lot of the people that I work with or because I am significantly younger than the people that I work with. So it's already really hard to pinpoint like, you know, what was the idea behind this comment type of thing. But it n- nothing has been, you know, uh, even remotely bad enough for me to reconsider uh, what I do and, and where I do it. So, yeah. I would say that my experience has been really pleasant as a woman in tech. As Patricia said, I also would have liked to see more women. But to be honest, working in communications or marketing in tech is a completely different experience than working as a software engineer. Um, one really pleasant experience that I had was that I had the opportunity to meet, even though they were not more women than men or in equal quantities, I had the uh, pleasure to meet some of the smartest, funniest women I've ever met in tech. Um, and they were software engineers or they are software engineers. Um, and I've also noticed that at least when I was working in the tech conference, um, in Austria, I've noticed that there are a lot of women who are aiming to be tech entrepreneurs, which was something a bit shocking to me because I was expecting to join an industry where there are not a lot of women. But my experience has been different because it's different to be an entrepreneur than to really go through the STEM on the STEM path to enter tech. I think that is the hardest one. Um, And I can talk from my personal experience that I would have probably enjoyed it a lot if I would have been encouraged or helped at the beginning as a young teenager or as a young child to not be afraid of math, to not be afraid of physics, because I am originally Romanian. I come from Romania. And when I grew up in the 90s, um, there was no such thing as encouraging women to follow STEM. Um, And I think if I would have been encouraged, I would have probably done it. And this is why I respect and admire the work your organization does, Molly, because these are the types of things that women need. They need encouragement. They need kind of, if you tell a woman that they can do something, they're much more likely to try because it's a problem of confidence. Ultimately, it's I don't think it's a problem of skills or I don't think it's a problem of a native, uh, you know, being bad at math natively. It's really just culture. Um, it's your environment, your friends, your family, and your school that needs to really tell you that it's possible and give you the tools to make it possible. I think that's a, a great point. It's something that I see from from our member community a lot in that in that tech space, and that's. I think the thing they comment the most on that they're grateful for, right, is the support, the mentorship, the the other people in their field saying, like, I can do this or showing them I can do this. I often think of um, a woman from from our Women Who Code Delhi chapter uh, who spoke on, um, you know, how she probably would have left tech a long time ago if she hadn't found Women Who Code Delhi because it it, she said in that quote, you know, it saved her career. It saved her career in tech because she found these mentors and these sponsors and these people who had been there or were now there and kind of in a similar um, space to you, Irina, she spoke on how, you know, she was never encouraged. It. In fact, like um, she had to break those stereotypes and those beliefs that, you know, her family and her community had placed on her, that this isn't a place for her or a space for her. And you know, I think that's such a big piece um, in this field as we see it continue to grow and and hopefully expand and and um, you know in more of those meetings, it's it's really that right that ability to to find those those mentors and those sponsors and those support systems um, that tell you you can do it and and don't kind of advise you to shy away or find something else. A thought came to my mind, and it, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm contradicting what I just said before, but as much as I was always kind of the, the only woman in, in the types of the teams and the things that like specific roles that I was doing, 
I did find, and I, and I, I know now that there's so many women who do this type of stuff and who, who are interested in the same and the same things that I am. And maybe they're just in different companies. And that was also the idea behind the Women in Cyber Association that we, that we built was because, you know, we, we were caught, there was a bunch of us, but we were all kind of alone in our own, you know, silos. Um, and so we wanted to kind of create this space where we could, you know, get together and still have this kind of sense of community and support and, and all of these things. Um, even if we didn't have it within our own organizations, but it's, it was still there. And it, you know, across Switzerland, there's, many women who are, you know, doing what I do or similar stuff um, and really, really cool ladies. And so we, we just wanted to kind of give also the opportunity for um, for other women who, you know, are interested or curious or like not so sure to have like a group of people to talk to. Um, and it's, you know, ranging from different seniority, seniority levels and uh, geographies within Switzerland and stuff like that and backgrounds a lot of I mean everyone has a different um, educational background and things like that so yeah there, there there are plenty of women sometimes you just kind of have to go and look for them um, but they're there. I think that's a great piece I think that's and that's so special that you've created this environment for them to find it and to to progress in there and and that kind of leads me into to my next piece that I was going to ask you about and that would be, you know, what advice or, or pro tips do you have for women that are looking to get into the field and this um, specifically into the tech community and working um, in these spaces where maybe they are a little more male dominated, but, you know, showing them there is a space for them? Well, I think my experience is not really uh, representative, but if I were to, to give someone an advice, it would be to really have the confidence to apply. And I can tell you a small story about how I applied to Proton. I, I was not in the same country with the company. I was in Austria. Their Proton is based in Switzerland. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience when I applied, not international experience at least. And I can tell you that Proton as a company is, is built by very smart people and the standards are very high. So even when I applied at the beginning of the company, it was quite difficult to get the attention of the leadership team. And I tried three times, even visited the office uh, when I was in Geneva, visiting Geneva. I offered to come by the office and pay them a visit, introduce myself after I already obviously went through the application process, did my resume in a very creative way. So it's really about this is kind of um, just an example of my life, but I think it applies to everything, everything you want to go after if you want it, just do it with confidence and do it without being stopped, just perseverance. Um, and that will definitely open more doors and give you more opportunities than being losing your confidence or losing your courage after the first no, because you're going to get many no's and not just as a woman, as a person in today's world, standards, expectations, and everything is really hard to get. Um, and this is the problem women have, right? It's we lack confidence. We know from data that women don't apply to jobs unless they uh, they check almost 80% of the job description. And as a hiring manager for many roles at Proton, I know that these hiring, um, these job descriptions are wishful thinking in most cases. And if you find that person that checks all the boxes, that's a unicorn. And you want that person 100%. But most people will probably not check all the boxes from the beginning, but there are things you can learn and companies know this. So just try and don't give up. I think that's, that's a perfect piece. You may not know this about one of the tools women who code has, but it's our women who code job board. And it's where companies, um, they, they post jobs, open jobs that are in their, their field um, that they're looking to fill. And one of the pieces that we we speak on a lot with our job board is apply anyways, because we know kind of exactly what you said um, and that, you know, women often talk themselves out of it. Well, I don't have every skill on here. So, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to move on to the next one or the next one um, and look for that perfect fit or sometimes go for a job that they're underqualified for um, because, because they're like, well, at least I, I, I check all the boxes. Um, and so, yes, apply anyways. I love that. Like, I, I, I hope we can keep reiterating that apply, 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 like keep pushing forward. And if I can just add one more thing, I think women completely underestimate how much they have to offer, because in a world where automation is really taking over most of the tasks that we do, 
you know, qualities that are more feminine generally in candidates like critical thinking, flexibility, collaboration, communication. Women are really good at this. And these qualities are needed in the workplaces. They have much more to offer than they think. Absolutely. I think it's really funny that you have this story, Irina. I had no idea that you had this uh, this experience being hired at Proton. But if I could just like add mine, because it's also a bit weird. Um, but I had um, I had connected on LinkedIn with my like soon to be manager at Proton when I was at Kudowski Security um, for something completely different. We were trying to organize a conference together, um, and then he posted that he was he was looking to hire for a certain role in, in his team. Um, and so I just wrote to him like, "Oh, hey, what kind of person are you looking for uh, in this role?" And he said, well, you know, send me your CV. And I was like, okay, not really what I was asking, but sure. Um, and so I did the interview uh, or the interviews and it came back like, oh, sorry, you know, we found someone else who's been better suited for the, for the job. Um, but we do think that you would be a really good element in the team. So can we create a job description for you? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, why not? Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's also kind of you make your luck, right? You I connected with this person uh, through, you know, similar interests and through we were trying to build something together. And it, it later on uh, led to a role that, you know, didn't even exist uh, and that was kind of created. So there's, I think there's something to be said of just, like as Irina said, like just, just go for it and do it and see, you know, um, come with your, with your skill set because clearly, you know, I didn't, I didn't meet, um, or I guess it wasn't what they were looking for, for the role that they had open. Um, but they saw something else in me. So I think it's also, you know, they saw that I had a, a different skill set and they're like, oh yeah, maybe we actually need that. Or we could really, we could really benefit from, from this. And so it's also, you know, just try and, and be confident in what, uh, what you're good at and, and how that brings value to, to the company that you would like to work at. That's an amazing story. And I think that's a great, a great example of advocating for yourself in some ways, um, I, I think I, personally, I know that's something I sometimes struggle with is, is that advocate advocating piece. And you hear that a lot from, from people in hiring as well as, you know, ask, you know, do you want to work remotely? And maybe it says, doesn't say remote, but ask, um, or, you know, what else can I do or how can I improve my resume or, you know, why did you pick that, that person? Could you give me some feedback? So I think that's a beautiful story of kind of that change that can happen. Um, if you, if you're there and you put yourself best foot forward. But I wonder, I, I wonder a lot. And sometimes I like to read about gender gaps in tech or anywhere, actually. One of my favorite topics is actually the lack of women uh, in developing products, like lack of women testing and developing products, such as personal uh, protection equipment, you know, like um, vests for policemen or even seatbelts in cars or simply developing tools that you can use around the house that you can actually put your hand around. Um, and this is, I think, a symptom of our society globally because we do recover from a period of discrimination. It's in the past, but we need to acknowledge it. And I think probably the lack of women in tech is a symptom of this because women do have a harder life in general. We have many more responsibilities as, as human beings and I do think that it's not really only up to women to fight for themselves. It's up to, you know, governments and uh, companies and other and men actually to support women in building the right environments for them to be able to thrive. Um, because, you know, when you're a mom or when you need to take care of a home and you don't have a supportive partner, you cannot dream of a tech uh, career. So I just wanted to mention this because I know women are told, be more confident, apply, try. Um, and this is just one part of the story. The second part is we need more people to acknowledge the fact that the systems need to change to be more equitable for women and men. Coming back to some of the things that Irina just said as well is, I think it's important for people to understand, like even in um, a team like mine, I mean, the security team at Proton, you might think that that's, you know, you have to be super technical and you do coding all day and that type of stuff. And some of my colleagues do that, but I don't. And 
and they need me. They're very happy to have me in the team. Um, and so, and as I mentioned, I, I've done coding. I've learned a few different programming languages in the past, um, but I never really enjoyed it. It was, it was for me a means to an end. I needed it to, you know, run my simulations and, and do my mathy stuff. Um, and the way to do that was to, you know, I needed to, to learn how to read and write code basically. And I think a lot of the times people in my experience kind of get or, or feel like they need to be really good uh, in order to, to, to go for it, even if the role that they're going for isn't necessarily technical. Um, so I think if, if you're that person, um, try to think of it as just like another skill, like reading and writing. You, most people know, or you know, in our environments at least know how to read and write. You don't need to love to read and write. You don't need to spend your, you know, all of your free time reading and writing, but it's a good skill to have. Um, and just programming, it can be seen that way. So maybe just like get some basic knowledge, maybe try to understand, um, some of it. And, you know, that's maybe good enough just to understand, you know, the environment that you're living in or the working in and the people that you're working with. Um, so don't don't stop and like I'm not a coder and therefore I can never be in the security team, for instance, type of thing. So I think that's um, that's something to keep in mind if if you're not you know not so confident about um, your skill set. Um, and and also coming back to something that Irina mentioned before is tech is so important right now. I mean everything that we do is online. Everything is an app. Everything is digital. And I think if you're I mean, if you're anyone uh, who, who feels like you want to be part of the conversation or you feel like your interests are not necessarily represented in, in the things that you use every day, then, you know, go and be part of it. You know, give your opinion, give your point of view and um, and then, you know, own it. Like if you're a mom, then be a, be a mom. Like don't hide the fact that you're a mom. So. Um, I think that because that brings an aspect and that, you know, at Proton, we have a few um, million Many. users, lots uh, of users. <laughs> users <laughs> I thought moms. <laughs> uh, also probably moms. <laughs> the, you know, the user base is, is pretty big and it's pretty, um, you know, geographically diverse and I'm guessing also gender diverse. I, I don't actually know, but I assume there are plenty of, of women and mothers and, and all of these people who are using the products. And I think the fact that you, you need, but those people also, you know, giving their opinion and helping to create these things because they have a different, uh, they have different priorities and different interests. And, and if if nobody knows them, if nobody says anything, then you know that whole population may be like, but what about this super basic feature? And it could be either like a product feature, but it could also be like a security or a safety feature or something like that. You know, what about my kids? If my kids are using this um, this app, you know, if nobody who's building the app has kids they may not think of these things. And so I think it's important to like have all of these different points of view and then the people who are, you know, different, who are representing these um, populations to, you know, to own it and to bring it. And, and you know, companies obviously have to support that, but it's, it's not something that should be hidden um, because then you're missing out on all of these potentially really good ideas or approaches and things like that. I think that was a wonderful pro tip uh, that's that's sometimes forgotten, and um, it, it brings me to to even some of the the user testing um, experiences I've had internally at Women Who Code, and and try this, and it's like I'm trying it from my perspective, but then someone else is trying it from their perspective, and their perspective, and their perspective, and we're all finding these different elements and these different pieces. And what if one of us wasn't there? That piece would be dropped or forgotten or maybe overlooked, um, and it it might be a critical element. So I think that was a a great piece of advice. Um, is there any you know, last element that you'd like to say um, or, or, or call to action that you'd like to bring forward um, as we kind of wrap up our conversation uh, today? I just wanted to mention uh, on the topic of not knowing how to code or not having to love to know how to code. Um, in tech, it's there's a role, which is the product manager role that requires this knowledge of coding or how software is built but it also requires a lot of good collaboration skills, project management skills, things are things that women are really good at. And some of the best product managers I've met are women. Um, and I would definitely encourage people uh, or women uh, from Women Who Code the organ your organization to 
try this role if coding is not what they love, but they learn the tech behind building software. It's a really interesting role and it's crucial to building great products. Um, and we do have openings for product uh, managers, product marketing managers, really a lot of openings because Proton is in a high growth period right now where we're looking for a lot of smart people to come join our mission to build a better internet. So my words to women who code are, if you care about privacy or think you would care about privacy and want to have purpose in your role, um, apply at Proton. We're at careers.proton.me. And I would be happy to meet you, whoever you are. If you are thinking of applying or, you know, you know, you're not confident about um, what, what you could bring to, to a role or whatever, I think, you know, try to try to see your skill set as broader as just maybe what you did in your previous role or as uh, in your, you know, your, your, your studies. Um, if you're, you know, a, a mother or if you, you know, have all these responsibilities outside of work, I think I like to see in, in the CVs that I kind of go through, I like to see people who are able to, um, to, to, to voice how that can help. Um, so even if it's not like in my previous role, I did this, that and the other, but it's, you know, if you're the one managing your family's budget and you're the one who's, you know, organizing the whole, you know, drop off, pick up the whole thing, all of the logistics that go with having, you know, a family or with doing, you know, whatever it is that you do. Um, having all of these responsibilities that we that women tend to have more of outside of work than 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 others. So I think if you can really just try to try to take those seriously, right, and acknowledge them for what they for what they are, um, I think that's that can be really powerful. And I think you know for all the people, the hiring managers out there, I think also take them seriously, right? These are these are real skills. Just because you're not getting paid for them doesn't mean that they're not they're not skills. Um, and I, I just remember seeing the CV of some some woman. I have no idea now who it was, but I loved the way she presented her 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 skills. She's like CFO of a family of five and CEO of this and that. And it was all like because it's it's true. I mean, she had those roles and those responsibilities, just not in a paid role. And I just thought it was really smart to to bring that out and say, listen, I do have these skills. I just apply them, at, you know, in a different way. So I think if you're, um, maybe if you do have those skills, just, you know, bring them forward and, and be proud of them because they're, they're just as worthy as, as others. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank, uh, thank both, both of you um, for joining us today on the Women Who Code podcast and sharing your knowledge and your experience, your pro tips, you know, everything that you highlighted and brought forward. And I want to, again, thank Proton for their generous contribution to Women Who Code. As a 501c3 organization, Women Who Code runs on the power of generous community uh, of support. We invite others to get involved by visiting our website at www.womenwhocode.com slash donate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Molly.